welcome to the Municipal Policy and Economic Democracy panel. Lessons and questions for New York City, that's where we are. Um, my name's Abby Sher, I'll be moderator. And uh, let's begin by settling down. And um, really happy to see people, happy that this conference has so much on municipality, on cities and economic democracy. It's a really important uh, dynamic relationship. Um, and uh, so what I wanna do is, I'm gonna give some very brief uh, framing remarks. Um, and, uh, but first I wanna introduce the people who are gonna be on the panel with us. Um, and they're gonna be speaking in the order of introduction. Um, and can the tech guy come up? Also, Mr. Tech Guy, could you? Great. Um, so this panel um, really was the brainchild of the Office of Financial Empowerment. Um, they were kind of the power and the motor behind um, some of the thinking around this panel. And Zain Abdesalam, right here, is uh, Director of Policy and Research uh, um, of the Office of Financial Empowerment of the New York City Department of Consumer and Worker Protection formerly known as the Department of Consumer Affairs. Um, it's gone through an upgrade. Um, and um, so OFE, the Office of Financial Empowerment, provides institutional support for community wealth building in the city. Um, and uh, they do research on debt and community wealth building strategies as a researcher. Uh, Zane has also contributed to keeping payday lending out of New York City uh, and to enact the city's f new Fair Work Week law to combat income mm -hmm. volatility by mandating stable and predictable scheduling in the retail industry. Um, second on the roster is Christine Corella, who's the Deputy Director uh, of the Business Development and New Economy Initiatives in the Office of the De Deputy Mayor for Strategic Policy Initiatives. Um, this morning, Phil referred to her. Every time someone had a question, he says, you should ask Christine. So, no <laughs> um, um, so she's working with the Office of Minority and Women-Owned Business Enterprises, um, and she's charged with harnessing resources across the city um, for business development and new economy initiatives. Um, and she's worked before this in, um, the Mayor's Office of Workforce Development, and um, she's also worked for the New York City Economic Development Corporation, uh, leading their economic inclusion projects, coordinated strategic planning for the US EPA during the Obama administration, um, and has consulted for the World Bank inspection panel. Um, then next up will be Daniela Del Rio, who's co-director of the New Economy Project, um, which is this great nonprofit helping promote economic justice and community controlled finance in the city um, in immigrant neighborhoods and communities of color. She's the board chair of the Lower East Side People's Federal Credit Union and a member of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York's Community Advisory Group. She's a recipient of the Francis Perkins Working People's Award from the Fiscal Policy Institute, the Mujeres Destacadas, uh, Outstanding Woman Award from El Diario La Prensa and the Revson Fellowship on the Future of New York. Um, commentating on the remarks is Jessica Gordon Nemhart, who's Professor of Community Justice and Social Economic Development in the Department of Africana Studies at John Jay College. Um, she is an affiliate scholar with the Center for the Study of Cooperatives at the University of Saskatchewan and at Howard University Center on Race and Wealth. Um, her specialty is community economics, black political economy, and popular economic literacy. Her book, Collective Courage, A History of African American Cooperative Economic Thought and Practice was a finalist for the 2014 University of Memphis Benjamin Hicks National Book Award, and I'm sure uh, people in this room have read it and appreciated it. Um, so that's the order that we're gonna go, and um, I just wanna say, the role of cities in the solidarity economy strategy um, 
the importance of municipalities for building a more just economy um, has been part of the structure and vision, I think, since um, the current configuration of this came into being. And I would, I would mark that. Um, I mean, we, when I was co-editor at an economic justice magazine called Dollars and Cents in the 90s, we were writing about land trusts and cooperatives, and I wrote an article about cooperative home care associates. But I would talk about the launch of the current moment um, for me where, where all of the thought came together was when Gar Alpovitz wrote America Beyond Capitalism, and it came out in 2004. And I read that book, and I was like, oh, Right, that's it, it just brought it all together. And the thing that Gar saw um, was that in order to build economic democracy, you have to pull together every arena. So that's cooperatives. And he says, look at all, right now we have all these cooperatives. Um, unions, you know, unions, you have big companies, unions are at the front line of a fight in order to um, make, get as much as possible to reform those companies. Um, and, um, uh, and then other kind of nonprofit structures like land trusts, um, but also municipalities. Um, there, where the municipal policies, um, hearkening back in some ways to the, the era of municipal socialism, where cities at the turn of the century in the progressive era and before were seen as um, as, as, as the ground zero for building more co common, socialized um, um, institutions. Uh, and, um, and that um, in this, Benjamin Barber wrote this book, When Mayors Rule the World. He was somebody who was a visionary who unfortunately died recently, unexpectedly. Um, he saw that you could have c city networks, c networks of mayors, like wh what's going on now around climate change, and that they could be a, a political force in themselves, um, that mayors had to connect across progressive left lines, um, not just sort of waiting for the governments to connect. And, um, and then another person that predated Gar um, that's inspiring people is Murray Bookchin, uh, who's an anarchist. So when you're looking at what the Kurds are doing in Syria, creating Rojava and their revolutionary city, they're inspired by Murray Bookchin's notion of, municipal, of municipalism, that there would be kind of these, in order for things to be democratic, you have to kind of really vote and, and govern things at the municipal level to be closer. That's as close as you can get to a real people's democracy. So cities are, um, they're a really, when you're building out a more just economy from a, a lot of different directions, um, uh, people have wondered, well, how can we reinvigorate cities which have very traditional stodgy economic development strategies? How can we, how can we invigorate them? Um, so let's get some thinking thinking going here and um, and so appreciate Zane uh, and his team for bringing some of these questions and the way that they've been exploring them uh, to the table here so you can you can go up or, or yeah if you want to or you have a clicker mm -hmm. yeah Mike thanks Abby for that great uh, literature review. Um, so, um, yeah, and I just want to give a shout out to and I, yeah, I'm not used to holding it right here, but um, but this does sound better. Um, I want to give a shout out to um, now a school, but once Murphy Institute. Um, it's a wonderful resource that we've had here for many, many decades. And um, it's just, it, it's really fitting that we're here having this conference that they've done so well uh, putting on. Um, 10 years ago, we did uh, the nation's largest uh, 
wage theft survey, um, and they gave us the space to interview the workers here across um, eight different occupations uh, that were prone to wage theft. And, and of course, we found uh, egregious levels of wage theft. So, um, yeah, just wanted to point this, this wonderful institution out. Um, so, as Abby said, I, I'm the Policy and Research Director for the Office of Financial Empowerment, and um, Sam Wild, a policy analyst here in the room, a colleague of mine, uh, we put this framework together that we'll be presenting. Um, I'll give you a little bit of uh, background on Office of Financial Empowerment. I didn't know of it before uh, I came to work for it, um, and um, so I... Uh, you know, we we uh, we focus on initiatives that uh, educate, empower, and protect um, residents and neighbors neighborhoods with low incomes, um, so they can um, improve their financial health and gain assets. Um, and we have a number of strategies that uh, we work on to do this. Um, but I'll mention the fifth one that br brings us to the, our work here, which is empowering neighborhoods to generate wealth. And, um, and that's where we hold our community wealth building initiatives. And uh, those two of those initiatives uh, are in play uh, currently. And our, our oldest one is uh, improving neighborhood financial health. and. So a couple years ago, with uh, with New Economy Project and and Day and Bed Stuy Restoration Corporation, um, we did this a collaborative for neighborhood financial health, where we created a a, a framework to um, evaluate how neighborhoods are helping their residents uh, with financial health. It has five goals and indicators that lead up to those five goals that indicate how well the neighborhood works along these lines uh, to, uh, to improve neighborhood health. I just wanted to point out one of the neighborhoods that uh, performs really well across all five goals, um, and it's an outlier in the Bronx. It's Bronx CD10. Um, most of the Bronx, unfortunately, um, uh, per performs lower in the neighborhood financial health indicators, and yet uh, Bronx CD10 across all five goals is in the upper third. And the reason why we think this is, is a third of the residents live in Co-op City. And um, that definitely, you know, where a third of the neighborhood lives in safe, stable, affordable housing, everything is possible from there. So um, it, it's a bright green spot up in the Bronx, and I think Co-op City has a lot to do with it. Um, so that's our neighborhood financial health. Um, today, we'll be presenting an excerpt on our research in, this, in the second strategy, and, which is uh, creating opportunities for inclusive ownership. And after our panel, we have a, a handful of of copies of the excerpt uh, up on stage, so feel free to grab them. Um, so this report, Municipal Policies for Community Wealth Building, um, we will be releasing it in the summer. It will contain 15 policies from around the world um, that, that show where public support for inclusive ownership um, has created equitable and resilient economies and communities. And um, so we've been to, well, we've researched, you know, from everywhere from South Korea to Spain, uh, to the Midwest, uh, upstate New York. Uh, these profiles come from all around. And, uh, and today we'll, we'll just highlight two of the policies. But with these policies, we've we've come up with a, another framework. Uh, <laughs> it's what researchers like to do. Um, and so we've come up with five principles, uh, essential principles uh, for successful inclusive ownership policies. And um, I'll put, I'll put a, a crude diagram up on the screen uh, 
to help uh, you follow along. Um, but so the, the first one, which is at the foundation of this structure uh, and is the foundation of any good framework is a legal and regulatory foundation uh, where the, the government uh, reg uh, creates a, legally, a legal definition and designation of what inclusive ownership structures are and um, including access to the ownership and distribution of the ownership, really clear definitions, and this is essential for the flow of public benefits and tax treatments. If, if, the, if, the, uh, if the public and the government can't identify uh, the institution, the entity, then they can't give special treatments for it. Um, and so uh, this framework is based on um, that inclusive ownership is fundamentally different than condensed ownership, okay? So we're talking about broad-based inclusive, multiple owner uh, entities. Um, so we have this legal regulatory foundation that sets up everything uh, from there. And uh, let me pull up this picture, so I can't really see it. Um, so then uh, we have three columns which are, um, which support uh, the, <laughs> the roof and uh, the whole sector of cooperative uh, uh, economics. And so the, the first column is uh, policies that provide business development support. And these, you know, are, are typical what, what many municipal uh, governments provide now to small businesses and SBS and things like that. Access to affordable and safe financing, access to markets, um, which um, MWBE is a good example of that, um, and business consulting and services. So, um, so that's the first column. The second column is a, are requirements around enterprise resilience, and these are requirements. Any good policy? Uh, hello? Uh, we'll have these requirements in place. Um, so, uh, first, an organizational resilience, which requires membership in broad cooperative associations, uh, and, um, and then a financial resilience, which is pretty crucial, requiring a certain level of profits to be retained and uh, indivisible inside the cooperative. And so, a, a typical legal threshold is 30%, but many go way above that. Um, so these profits can never be uh, spread to individual members. Okay, they stay within the cooperative. And, uh, and then the, the last column, social impact, to, um, a mission to fulfill community wealth building. And um, of course, requiring high employee ownership um, is, is crucial. A solidarity fund requiring a set portion of the cooperative's profits to go um, toward a fund to develop new cooperatives. I think a lot of the European uh, success in this sector is because of the solidarity funds and, uh, and, and the spread of cooperation across, across businesses. Um, and uh, connecting place through neighborhood investment programs. So, so these social impact requirements uh, that, that, that any good policy and, and a, a holistic framework um, would have. And then finally, these, all this builds up towards a, just a common normalization of cooperatives and um, inclusive ownership within government, within the public sphere, whether it's business associations, the civil society, it's just, it's recognized, it's normalized, and, um, and just a common uh, discussed um, solution for economic development, or, or it, 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 it's a go-to. And, um, it's, and it's, it's gaining ground here, Thanks. And, um, but I think it could be more part of our, our uh, public sphere. 
Um, so we, we've seen mayor's offices popping up uh, in the past year in uh, Richmond and um, Rochester, upstate New York, mayor's offices of community wealth building. This is a public recognition of how important this is to uh, to a, an alternative to com to economic development as it has been done. Um, and then public awareness campaigns, uh, things like that, and conferences like this. Um, so many of the policy of the 15 policies, um, um, really, of the 15, they, what they do is determine what sur how you allocate surplus. Okay, and the two that we show in this uh, in this uh, in excerpt. Um, the first one is from Italy, and it's uh, a mandatory reinvestment commitment and cooperative federations. Um, so um, the mandatory reinvestments, this is uh, some pictures from Italy. Um, so uh, the Italian government places two special requirements on profits, one that they retain 30% uh, into an indivisible reserve that I had talked about. Um, you can reinvest into the co-op, into the cooperative, um, and it can be, or it can be a source of liquidity, but it can never be dispersed to individual members. And then the uh, mandatory cooperative federation uh, membership uh, also includes, you have to give 3% of your net profits to investment funds to build other cooperatives and support other cooperatives. I mean, this is uh, nowhere else in private capital do you see that kind of uh, distribution of profits. Um, impacts, of course, are, are great employment, uh, less precarious, less layoffs during economic turndowns, and, um, and, and these two requirements just strengthen the whole cooperative sector. And then briefly, the last, um, the last one, which which Dave will be talking uh, uh, about the topic, um, is the Champlain Sh Champlain Housing Trust up in Vermont. Um, it's the largest community land trust in the U.S. today, and um, started off in the '80s with Mayor Bernie Sanders and um, and. <laughs> um, and its impact is on affordable housing and um, permanent affordable housing. So this is uh, some freestanding pavilions and then some cooperative housing, uh, which unlike in New York, uh, uh, the cooperative housing there is, is rental, um, but there is some shared equity housing. But as, we, as many of us know, uh, community land trusts, the, the land is owned uh, inclusively broadly, and, and then the houses are put on top. And I imagine Dave may be speaking about that some, a little bit. So, okay, thank you for the time. Great, hi everyone. Um, as Abby mentioned, I'm Christine, and I should set expectations now that um, I can be a good director for everything that Phil said. I can't always answer all of the questions. Um, uh, I say that humorously, I, I'm really delighted that you all got to hear from him directly. It's my um, charge to take some of that and execute it. Um, I'm really honored to be on this panel. I just want to like go through how each panelist inspires my work. It's a name that Jessica's book is on my refrain regularly. I often talk about collective courage. I hope. I hope appropriately telling people to read your book. Um, Day has been a thought partner in all of my time back in New York City government over the last seven years, I'd say. Um, and Zane, actually before he joined me in city government, was on the other side of the table as labor, but helping us to push and make really um, meaningful programs, robust programs, thinking through the voice and needs of workers. Um, I say that actually because I've been in government on and off for the last uh, 12, 13 years. Um, and while we do a lot, I want to talk about how government sets the stage. And I'm really grateful that I'm part of driving a charge from a municipal leader like Deputy Mayor Thompson. Um, but I want to be really clear that um, it is municipalities in partnership as part of an ecosystem of really critical stakeholders who um, both push inside and outside, help us build key partnerships and, and curate institutions 
solutions in a way that municipalities alone um, can't and probably shouldn't if we really have a robust vision for economic democracy. And so um, I've had a lot of conversations about economic democracy with my peers across the country. Um, and whether you have firmly controlled cities or decentralized cities, um, I think we're all trying to grapple with what is a new form of municipality that is not just two, two directional, right? Is um, a mun uh, mayors being elected by governance and pushing back out decisions that they think are right, um, or voters appropriately voting out administrations if they don't follow their values, but this is more dynamic and actually building together. And I actually think we're reinventing models of government altogether in, in the service of economic democracy when we think in that way. Um, and that's very much shaping, I think, what we're trying to do here um, in this administration. Um, before I talk about what we're doing as an administration, I just want to give everyone a little bit of a line of sight um, into economic development as it has happened previously. Um, just because I have a, I'm going to take a cue from um, Roger Green earlier this morning and naming, just lifting up some of that personal experience because I think it'll shape what we're trying to do now. Um, about 12 years ago, I worked for the Department of City Planning and then Deputy Mayor Dan Doctoroff was my was my boss, and um, the conversation about what economic development should be in service of was quite different. It really spoke to the conversations we're having about the commons, um, which interestingly, right, most of our municipal regulations say um, we have to bid to the highest bidder. It's part of our civil service reform since the 1800s, actually, that we've said bidding to the higher... Uh, Putting public property to the highest bidder is a way we ensure fairness. I think we're really imagining and thinking, trying to rethink that, uh, and I look forward to that conversation, but just to name how different that was. Um, and then I was really grateful uh, leaving city government uh, at that time and having the chance to work at MIT's CoLab alongside some of the work organizing in the Northwest Bronx, um, the Com Northwest Bronx Community and Clergy Coalition. I saw many of our friends and colleagues here who animated and said, well, if we weren't just negotiating in that binary, what would it look like for us to do something different? How do we react differently to government, to economic development anchors, to investors? Um, and I learned a lot from thinking, wow, this is uh, in some ways enabled by municipal government, but critical is community power. Um, and so fast forward, I um, have spent the last, uh, since November, with this formal charge on behalf of Deputy Mayor Thompson to do all that he said, um, setting expectations here. Um, but I use that experience of mine to name really importantly how we're thinking about it. Is It is um, powered by Phil, uh, Deputy Mayor Thompson's vision, um, but not done alone by city government. Um, we're really trying to think differently about how we curate um, our role as a city and work with different places of power um, to move towards economic democracy. And so with that, now actually what exactly we're doing. Um, I think it's really important to say that I'm really proud that I'm in the office of minority and women-owned business enterprises. We have a, sp and a, a special and significant policy frame around that. Um, I think it's part of the legacy, actually, that Phil spoke about earlier, that um, the civil rights movement has been codified in policies like minority and business enterprises and affirmative action. Um, and worker rights and voices have been dislocated from that. And so um, actually in my last role in the Office of Workforce Development, I was disheartened to know how many times um, issues that helped workers were pitted against issues that were about inclusive business ownership. And I said, like, that's, we shouldn't be on other sides of the table. Um, and so one of the really important substantive issues that I think we're trying to take on is how do we really enmesh um, our vision for inclusive ownership and inclusive of workers. Um, and so with that, I want to say, and really building off of the amazing work that um, the team at OFE have built, um, the way we're concretizing economic democracy and an emerging policy frame are really centered on three issues. Um, and I think we're trying to iron out some of the policy matters of it. We are centering on inclusion. So it is really key that the minority and women-owned business enterprise policy that um, advocates for the last 30 years and across the country have worked to make possible is critical to us. It is really at the fore for um, that for whom question is one of the only policies where we really explicitly name our goals around racial and gender inclusion. Um, second, we care about ownership. Um, and so really naming 
all the things I think many of us share uh, an opinion on um, who gets valued, the profits, where, where they go. And so we're really trying to name that ownership piece um, as critical. And then the third is about voice and who is at the decision-making table. Um, and so interestingly, the history, if, if anyone is steeped in MWBE work, I'm just getting fully around it, so welcome that in the discussion. Um, that certification is actually inclusive of those three elements, but does not invite more broad and collective ownership. And I think that's a real opportunity for us um, so that we're building upon the tremendous legacy of our businesses owned by women and people of color, and also really accelerating many of the policies that have enabled their growth long term. Um, and within that, I want to name and, and what's really important to us building on that legacy is that, um, to your point about economic development, we have said that economic development happens through technology and innovation. That's the broader paradigm we operate in. In New York City, we actually examined and determined that the only group of businesses that has grown steadily over the last 10 years, adding jobs, creating jobs, are businesses owned by women of color. And so we are really talking about a very different form of economic development when we center around that data. The, the part I'm less proud to say is that disproportionately, um, despite that level of capacity and power of economic generation, um, both in contracting, access to finance, public and private measures are not honoring the aspirations of those businesses founded by women of color and the employees who are there. Um, so you just lift that up as an example of the way that we can really anchor on existing policy to accelerate the shared vision tactically for economic democracy. Um, so just pulling back, so I, just to name where, um, you know, I think as, as has been mentioned, you know, other cities have created offices of community wealth building um, or have significant programs. We're trying to build on that, but we're actually working across all of the deputy mayor's portfolio. Um, and I, I want to just name that because I think that's a really important way to think about not just Deputy Mayor Thompson or myself, but how we move a municipality of 330,000 workers directly. And then all of our, um, as we know with, with our budget coming on, we're very clear about who else is employed by public dollars. Um, so it's insufficient if we think about what our office is doing, if we don't think about it in this landscape. Um, so Phil's team is really centered on offices that focus on um, uh, people who have been excluded from our economy, so people with disabilities, our Young Men's Initiative, our Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, really centering on that impact piece, and then the power side of this, of our Democracy NYC Initiative, and our Office of MWBE and Small Business Development. Um, and so we're trying to take those principles and really figure out how we shape and inform those programs and all of our colleagues in city government and in their partnerships with you to advance economic democracy. Um, just to say two other things really concretely, I think, um, so our charge expressly, as Phil has shared, is um, thinking at three levels. So one, how do we reconnect work and wealth through employee ownership? And so we're really trying to build on the tremendous work of um, folks in the worker ownership space here in New York City and beyond to really grow um, and set ambitious goals for worker ownership. Um, the core second piece is business has been a critical place for building wealth. Um, as I mentioned earlier, really syncing up how the growth of employee-owned enterprises is also connected to our MWBE agenda. Um, and I want to name there that, you know, Phil mentioned this this morning, every year we commit to $3.6 billion of spending with minority women-owned businesses. How do we really unlock that to make it catalytic for our economic development agenda? Um, and the third piece is really thinking at the community scale, how do we harness investment? Um, and so, you know, again, just to name the other levers that municipalities have, um, you know, we know the programs that we invest in, um, both for businesses and for workers, um, that shakes out to about um, almost a half a billion dollars every year that we spend. But as important are the investments that we all make collectively, like our pensions, um, like our economic development incentives, um, like the ways we convene and incentivize certain forms of capital. Um, so we're really trying to work with those stakeholders at that macro level and say, how can the city convene or use its levers to direct that towards economic democracy principles um, and outcomes? Um, so that's my time. Excited to be in discussion with you all about it.
All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Whew. I hope everyone's got some caffeine or a little sugar over there. I recommend a little um, lemon bar situation. Um, so I, I'm here representing New Economy Project, um, which is a citywide economic justice organization that works with community groups throughout New York City to fight for economic justice in an economy that works for all. Um, so we, you know, we do provide one-on-one -on -one support to organizations supporting their neighborhood-based education, outreach, institution building, and other kinds of local work that they're engaged in. Um, and we then bring groups together in coalitions to fight for bigger level uh, system change, uh, targeting campaign, targeting corporations that are harming their neighborhoods in certain cases, also pressing for um, policy change and other kinds of uh, you know, systemic change and progress that will benefit all of their communities. Um, and we've been doing this work for about 24 years in New York City. Uh, we have one office based in Manhattan and we work with groups all over. Um, and they range from immigrant serving organizations and housing groups to um, labor and worker centers and you name it. Um, our campaigns, we kind of, sometimes we talk about them as having, we have these two kinds of spheres of work that we do in partnership with these different groups and coalitions. On the one hand, we're um, pressing for change in our current system. Um, we have a major uh, sort of financial justice set of campaigns through which we expose and challenge ways that Wall Street and other corporations extract wealth from communities of color, um, and perpetuate segregation and inequality in our city and beyond, not to mention our economy and our planet and so on. Um, and then we have another sphere that's focused on affirmative solutions. And through that is the work that we're doing to support community land trusts around the city, um, to support worker-owned businesses, food and other cooperatives, um, and sort of cooperative and community-led development in general. Uh, we also have a citywide campaign pressing for a public bank for New York City, which is one of the things um, I wanted to talk a little bit about, as a way to create a municipal-owned financial institution dedicated to actually reinvesting back into New York City's economy, and uh, specifically to have a focus on supporting cooperative economics, inclusive ownership, all of these kinds of models that we're talking about today. Um, and then we have a statewide uh, kind of equity agenda through which we're actually working with a, hopefully a, a new Albany uh, <laughs> to press for uh, an affirmative agenda there to support community development lenders, to support uh, uh, you know, the employee ownership center that Senator Bailey's proposed and many other kinds of strategies to promote community wealth building and to keep payday and predatory lending out of our state um, when, as one example of the kind of wealth extraction that we're fighting, you know, we, we need to keep out. If we're talking about affirmative wealth building, we need to make sure we're also holding the line on the kinds of industries that are just clamoring to get into New York and uh, sort of extract wealth from low-wage workers, from people in neighborhoods of color, um, you know, which we're, we've been really fortunate to hold the line on some of these big battles in New York. So... Um, I guess uh, just a couple of thoughts I'll throw out there to start, and then I think we should really just kind of save a lot of time for the Q&A and discussion, given the audience here. I feel like that'll be really robust. Um, you know, I would say that a couple of the ways that we think about municipal support for uh, inclusive ownership or for cooperative economics is sort of, on the one hand, making sure that these kinds of entities are supported and even prioritized in public decision making. So in terms of allocating public, pro publicly owned property, housing, um, subsidy, you know, to actually that we believe that city government should uh, prioritize these kinds of benefits to institutions that are providing the, the sort of broadest public good. Um, making sure that these entities have access to existing programs. Um, and so that they can participate, for example, community land trusts can participate and respond to RFPs, have access to different financing that's available to develop or preserve um, or rehabilitate housing for low-income New Yorkers and so on. Um, and then there's policies that can, cr that can support the sort of formation or expansion of these kinds of entities. And there's a lot of different policy barriers that we can talk about that, um, you know, can, can hinder the development of these 
institutions. So right now in New York City, it feels like there's this groundswell of support um, among community groups and elected officials and, and on and on uh, to create these different models. I think there's a broad recognition that we need a different kind of economic development. There's the major Amazon victory, right, that Amazon was able to, uh, to be defeated. And there's, uh, you know, Rikers is closing. Those organizations are thinking about how should, the, how should funding now trickle down into these communities um, where incarceration, you know, has harmed those neighborhoods and those families the most. There's a, you know, emerging uh, industry, you know, the cannabis industry is thinking about, well, first of all, how are they going to get access to financial services? But then secondarily, you know, once there's this new revenue at the state level, where does that go? You know, and what would a kind of reparations-based model look like? And in all of these discussions, it's, you know, I feel like cooperatives and community land trusts, community development financial institutions are really front and center in these conversations that groups want to have. They've won and fought successfully against the bad, and they're trying to challenge themselves, and we're all challenging each other to think about well, what do we want to see in those in in place of Amazon? What do we want to see um, in those communities to support, you know, development in these communities that have been so ravaged by incarceration and drug arrests and so on? So it's a really, I think, ripe, interesting moment where more groups than ever are wanting to do this work and rethink our economy in these various ways. And so. The city, I think, has, you know, we, we love working with um, the Department of Worker and Consumer Protection, the new name, I'm still getting used to it, and the guys, these guys at OFE and everyone else in that office especially, I think, have given such thoughtful energy um, to thinking about how the city can support this kind of work, um, hopefully while also embracing um, community leadership, right? So this is one of the challenges that comes with thinking through policy strategy, right? So you want the city to support, but you don't want them to control. Um, you want the city to create, you know, to have, provide access, but how do you shape that so that the individuality of projects can still thrive and exist? Um, you know, in the community land trust sphere, speaking to some of the points that Zane outlined earlier, we were able to get a law passed, a New York City law passed a few years ago that defined community land trusts put it in the New York City's code for the first time, because it didn't actually exist there. And that, that way, groups could understand the definition for the purpose of working with the city's housing agency to enter into agreements um, with HPD, Housing Preservation Development. And it was a real kind of building block, we think, for getting more support to CLTs. Beyond that, we want the city now that it has a definition to actually prioritize and continue supporting disposition of actual land and housing um, and other kinds of support for those institutions so they can thrive. So that's a really important third piece. I talked about programs and policy and then financial support is really huge. The number of worker co-ops in the city has what tripled over the past few years, largely um, through incredible organizing and coalition building as well as financial support from city council discretionary funds. Um, the, CL the CLTs that we're working with around the city, we've all come together to propose a similar initiative inspired by the worker co-ops to incubate and expand land trusts around the city to create these new entities, these partnerships in communities around the city that are struggling against market rate development and gentrification and displacement. And with those CLTs, they will be able to kind of hold land in common out of the speculative market and prioritize development that benefits the communities. Um, I brought some slides that I can show later during the Q&A if anyone wants to see. And I know my time's up, so I'm gonna pause. I'm actually stop there and pass it over um, to Jessica and save the rest of the slides and whatnot for the discussion portion. So thank you. Thanks, everybody. Um, it's actually really exciting to hear uh, what's happening in New York City. Sometimes I claim that it's all because of me. <laughs> I moved back here. I grew up in Rockland County, and I moved back here in 2009, and that's when everything started happening, right? So I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, I didn't do it. But um, <laughs> it's nice to right, take some credit. Maybe that I was here was helpful. Who knows? Um, 
So, yeah, I mean, you don't normally hear city officials talking about this kind of language, but we've got uh, inclusive ownership, voice, social impact, legal recognition, mandatory reinvestment, right? Decision-making voice, coalition building and organizing. Those are all some of the elements that in the research I've done that I found have been really important to making sure that a solidarity and a co-op economy really get started and get stabilized. So it's exciting that we, you know, to, to find out that we've got this huge municipality that's actually working on that and that we've got organizations either partnering or pushing um, to keep that moving. So I do want to, you know, I want to raise up that excitement. I want to talk about um, one of my colleagues, Stacy Sutton, has put together a study called Cooperative, Cooperative Cities, where she actually looked at 12 cities in the US for their support, based mostly for worker co-ops, but in general, sort of solidarity economy. And she has, um, she actually divided them into developer cities, endorser cities, and cultivator cities. And New York falls into the cultivator city that actually uses grassroots and advocacy based with city investment, not just city uh, support, not just city validation, but actual city investment, but because of the grassroots insistence on doing this, which to me is kind of, Oh, maybe the more organic way. A lot of the other co-op uh, co cities, some of them are city-led with civic institutional backing. Some of them are grassroots and advocacy-led, but the city just validates. So we're like in that category of kind of the two best worlds, right? The grassroots bubbled it up and demanded it, and then the city responded with actual money and some kind, some level of investment. So I think we should be proud of ourselves to be in the middle of that. If you want to know the other cities, just in case, since I mentioned them, the developer cities and those are the ones where the um, it's more um, civic institutions and city-led. That's Cleveland, Richmond, Virginia, and Rochester, New York, which I think are in some of your, going to be some of your final examples. The endorser cities is the larger group, and they're the ones where there's some grassroots activity, but the city more validates it, doesn't put as much money and support in. That would be Austin, Texas, Berkeley, California, Boston, Oakland, Philadelphia, and Richmond, California. And then the cultivator cities, it's just New York, Minneapolis, and Madison. So I think we're in a good place. The question is, what else do we need to be doing, right? How do we hold people to the fire? How do we get more money and investment into this? And what are the other kinds of principles we need to be thinking about? Um, of course, I can't read my own notes, but I'll, I'll figure it out. Um, the, the enabling laws and regulations, which um, Zane already talked about, I want to hold that up also because we're, we've been learning, especially I've been working with groups in the southern U.S. about how to promote more worker ownership, especially worker co-ops and more solidarity economy support. And it turns out um, a lot of places don't have the enabling laws that would really make it much easier to start. So making sure we've got laws, not just that say how to start a worker co-op, what's uh, a democratic ESOP, what are the, um, what's the definition of a land trust, right? Um, if you don't have that, it's really hard to actually incorporate businesses that then can be um, connected to or recognized by city governments for the support. So luckily, we've, we've got a lot of that in place here in New York, but it's another one of those things, especially if you're from somewhere else, that you need to look more carefully into and make sure that there's a movement for that. The second piece is the education piece. And we have that a little bit in New York, but I would argue we probably need it more. Um, everything I've ever studied about co-ops and the solidarity economy movement is that to create more, you really need people who understand, who, uh, uh, who are connect, connect themselves to the model, understand it, and see where they can go with it. And that is sometimes harder than we think, but it also can be easier than we think, too. But we sometimes get so excited about doing all the top-down stuff 
that we don't think about the simple thing of we need to talk to people about these things. We need to get people realizing that they actually practice some of these things. Like so, so many people use the susus and uh, you know revolving loan funds among their community or at their church or whatever. And so they need to understand that's a very you know the community development financial institutions are a similar model and and use that model of trusting each other and pooling scarce resources so you have a pot to do something else with. So we already do it. You just didn't name it or you didn't realize it was a similar principle to these other things, right? Collective decision making, right? We all think that's so foreign to everybody, but you know, at least functioning families do that sometimes. We don't always do it, um, but right? But that's what, when we say it's a functioning family, we usually mean that's one of the things we usually mean is that they figure out how to talk to each other and resolve conflict and come to decisions together, often about money. Right? And so now we want people to do that in a work environment or in a housing environment. Um, and yet they, we say, oh, nobody knows how to do that. We can't do it. Well, we can't do it because we don't hold up the ways that we do it well, and we always focus on what we don't do well. So that's, that's what I also mean about education. But I really think we need to start with kindergarten, and I've been on this soapbox before, but in terms of teaching people about how to cooperate and how whatever, we actually beat it out of children in pre-K, kindergarten, and first grade, right? If you think about what it means to pass kindergarten, basically you pass kindergarten when you see yourself as an individual that knows how to keep their hands to themselves, look at the teacher and regurgitate what the teacher says. If you co cooperate, unless, you know, you're supposed to cooperate a little bit when you're playing in the sandbox. But when you get to the real stuff, like school and learning and reading, you're supposed to do it all on your own and follow what the teacher tells you. So if you don't do that, you flunk kindergarten, right? But if you don't do that, you're actually a cooperator, <laughs> right? So we're saying to make it in this world, you shouldn't cooperate. In fact, by the time you get to what, third grade, it's cheating if you cooperate, right? You're not supposed to turn to your neighbor and ask them what they think or whatever. I just heard a funny story from an educator the other day who was saying, um, I think it's the Asian American community who often teach their children in study groups and that kind of thing. And one kid, I know I'm running out of time, but this is funny. Uh, one, young, one little boy uh, was in the practice test for some statewide test. And he got up in the middle of the test to go ask his neighbor something. And the proctor, of course, got all upset. You can't move around, you can't ask, you can't talk to anyone. And he said, well, if he knows the answer, then we all know the answer. <laughs> and that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. So education is important. And just fast, because I'm out of time. Um, I do think we also need to also figure out this non-exploitation, both in funding levels and in how people relate to each other. Because too often, even the feel-good stuff that I'm talking about, we just do it between homogeneous groups, but when we're of different races, different sexual orientations, different genders even, we can't figure out how to talk better to each other, or how to treat each other right. And so we've got to figure out that piece as well. And then my last thing before they take me off the stage is we sort of hinted at it, but this notion of collective wealth is really important. That it's not whether each individual has $10 million or a million dollars even or whatever, because in this world, we're, all, we're, none of a, we're never going to have you know, everybody be a millionaire, but we can all be prosperous, especially through a collective ownership model. And so that it's not just inclusive ownership, but understanding how if we own a, a community asset together, then we're all wealthier. Our communities are safer and better. We can feed our families. We have a place to live, et cetera. We don't have to have the million dollars, but we have to have the community wealth. And I hope and think that's what we're all talking about, and that's what we're looking to move toward. Thank you. Uh, this session goes till 4, um, and I, I hope you will Forgive me, uh, but I wanted to ask the panelists to open up the questions for one another um, or their reflections on one another. Um, so if, uh, since you're right here at my left. Um, 
I'm just struck by what you said, Jessica, about just how much this will take. And I think I, again, want to say, you know, we, especially given public education systems or the $200 billion we all own collectively in New York City pension funds, just how embedded our thinking needs to be. And so the city creates in a critical platform, but we have to think about how to work with you all and all together to build this. Yeah, I, I don't have a question, um, but I did like your last point about collective wealth and, um, and you know, the, the terminology, uh, you know, inclusive ownership, broad-based ownership, cooperatives, uh, you know, I, I think collective wealth really gets to um, what we're driving at and um, the policies that we're, we're recommending and researching really limit um, individual wealth, you know, and that's what the laws are about, limiting, limiting profit for individuals and, and determining how they, that surplus will be distributed. And I think that's crucial, whether it's the 30% indivisible fund or contributing to your, uh, to your, you know, neighboring cooperatives. Um, I think that's really important. And thanks for pointing that out. Um, well, first, I have a kindergartner, so that really uh, hit home to me. It's true. Yeah, I, I hear you on all of that. Um, but um, I just, I also wanted to, I, I wanted to dig a little more into this notion of um, kind of individual versus community wealth building, because I do feel like to the extent public policy exists around, you know, trying to support wealth creation for lower income people, it is very individualistic. And, um, you know, there's a whole asset building field that is well-intended, right, and um, trying to create, help people create assets individually, start up businesses, buy homes that can appreciate in value, and then you make a windfall when you sell to the next sucker, you know. <laughs> um, but, you know, all of these kinds of strategies for asset building are very individualized. And, and we encounter this a lot in the work that we do to promote community land trusts. Right, because um, there's, I don't know where the IT guy went, but I was gonna show you a couple of images. If he pops back in, if someone wants to grab him. Um, but, so the whole idea of community land trust is that you're decommodifying land, and you're putting ownership of the land, you're separating it from what's built on top, the ownership. You're putting it in the hands of a community-controlled nonprofit. That's what a CLT is. It's not some magical thing. It's a nonprofit that holds and owns the land and decides collectively through a board, sometimes they have memberships that decide what happens on top. And it's a way that CLTs have been able to pres preserve affordable housing permanently, not for 10 years or 20 or 30 years, but permanently. Um, it's a way for communities to preserve affordable commercial space for local small businesses. In the city, the worker co-ops are extremely connected and fired up about the CLTs because there's a lot of alignment and vision and there's ways they can work together. Community-owned solar energy infrastructure can get built on a CLT. Community gardens and farms. So it's a really flexible model that can kind of serve as a backbone for accountable, locally driven development in their communities. Oh, okay. Can you um, just, yeah, thanks, sorry. I can't talk and chew gum at the same time. Uh, or walk and chew gum, I shouldn't talk and chew gum. Um, uh, so where was I? Oh yeah, but so I feel like, so the, I'll talk about one example here. So in New York City, there's one, it's already loaded up. Yeah, it's the next one, I just didn't know how to switch over. Um, so in New York City, there's a Cooper Square Community Land Trust in the Lower East Side. Have you heard about Cooper Square? Raise your hand. No? Wow, okay. So this is part of the problem. All right, Jessica gordon Emhart has not heard about CLT. How does this happen in our own little field, right? We're all like the best kept. I'm so tired of hearing people say like, credit, community credit unions, those are the best kept secrets, CLTs. But like, we need to get these not being secrets. Um, so I'll just, let me click over really quickly. I just want to show you a couple of images. Uh, okay, well, I'm gonna skip. These are redlining maps that show just, you know, sort of lack of investment in communities. I don't think we have time to do all of that. I'm gonna go straight to some CLT hopeful land. Hold on. But, okay, so Cooper Square has preserved in the Lower East Side, very gentrified and gentrifying neighborhood. Oh gosh, my clicker's not working. 
Um, I'll leave it here for a second so you can enjoy some headlines. Um, so Cooper Square CLT has preserved upwards of 400 uh, units of affordable housing and deeply affordable. So if you work on housing issues, you know that there are many, many New Yorkers that can't, they don't make enough money to afford affordable housing. And so they're actually preserving what's called deeply affordable housing for extremely low income and very low income New Yorkers and going as low as 30% of the area median income, whereas affordable can be sometimes 80, 120%. So they're going, they're reaching some of the lowest income New Yorkers and retaining, helping those people retain their homes, their communities in a neighborhood where they would have been displaced if it were not for the community land trust. Um, they talk a lot about social equity, right? So. You think about home equity as you buy at a certain price, you wait for your house to appreciate, increase in value, and then you sell, and that's your like retirement nest egg, or that's your, you know, that is your your household wealth, and so on. Um, in the case of a CLT um, that has home ownership, because it can also be for rental, then there's a restriction on how much equity and profit an owner can make if and when they sell. And so while you're not, you're still going to be well, better off financially, right? You've preserved what you put into the house. You get a little margin sometimes of profit. The point is to keep that housing affordable. It's not to help you individually get that windfall and run, right? Because if you, you, these things are at conflict, right? The individual wealth building is at odds with affordable housing preservation. And I feel like that's something that is a real struggle. So when we talk about CLTs, um, you know, what Cooper Square talks about is social equity. People were able to stay in their communities, have their support networks, have financial stability because they're not worried about their rent going up. They're not worried about a landlord trying to place, push them out. They're able to send their kids to school. They're able to pursue life opportunities and have just basic dignity and stability in their lives. But when you talk about CLTs out in the world, you, the response you get is like, well, we have a, even, I'm, I'm talking about like among allies, like not naysayers, like people that you would, that generally are sympathetic to, you know, social justice and whatnot. But there's this view of like, we have a racial wealth gap that's widening and worsening in this country. So you're going to prevent families of color from building wealth the one way that we have, really, if you're not an extremely wealthy person. So it's, it really challenges people's notions of like how we're going to advance collectively and provide security. Um, you know, so it's, it's a question. There's answers to all of these things. You know, we had a foreclosure crisis that wiped out. Um, there was net loss of home ownership and net loss of wealth among families of color as a result. So, you know, some of the folks we work with in the asset building field that I think were feeling very reflective at that moment in time said to us, like, our field is a failure. I mean, this was like, there are gains and gains to be had, but like, think about the wipeout that that subprime lending and foreclosure crisis, which was so concentrated in neighborhoods of color, as our little map shows you. Um, you know, it, I feel like there's a lot to, of deep kind of paradigm shifting that needs to happen in our sort of policy, in our own minds about how this all works, and to think about safety, social safety nets and other forms of security that we can provide families so that the home, the, the individual asset doesn't become the one thing that people can rely upon or that they see as their one way out of poverty or one way into like sort of so upward mobility. Sorry, I want to open it up, but I just thought of one thing to add to your issue about people being worried about, you know, home ownership is the only way to get wealth, so why would we limit that? Um, well, first of all, we're, again, we're never all going to be able to be homeowners. We're never all going to be able to be individually wealthy, but if we can make sure about that social equity. But the other thing to think about, um, I used to actually study wealth inequality, and one of the other things is the people who are the richest some of their, their portfolio is diverse. It's not just that they own a home, they have business equity. And so if we can give people business equity through the worker co-op and then social equity through housing, affordable housing co-ops, well then we can still be prosperous. I don't want to say rich, but we can still be prosperous. And we need to think about it in those ways, I think.
Okay, so this is a pretty quick question. I um, work with uh, Group Equity Cooperative uh, Housing Development uh, in Madison, and that uh, is where I'm based. And then I also work with uh, NASCO, North American Students Cooperation, um, doing Group Equity Housing Co-op Development in the US and Canada. Um, and I know that um, as part of kind of New York's attempt to um, provide for extremely low income um, affordable housing opportunities, there's been some moves to uh, like reopen the, the conversation on uh, SRO style uh, group equity housing co-ops as options for people to be able to enter into group equity ownership of those, of those buildings and way, in ways that they'd be able to then potentially partner with CLTs or CLCs and be able to uh, have that collective ownership of those buildings. Um, do you, like, those of you who are, like, working here in, in New York, because, uh, like, do, can you speak to the current status of that or if that's uh, remaining a, a priority at all? Yes, I would like it if you could update us on the state of the public banking project in New York City. Um, thank you for your presentations. Um, I've heard that the MWBE program does not really support um, uh, minorities, and I'd like you to elaborate on that because um, it seems to be a huge burden for minorities, and, are, and are, how are you evolving it so it can really benefit minority groups? Burrell, can, can you uh, reframe your question um, with that context you gave? Uh, can, can you, yeah. yeah. I was going to ask what, if any, uh, focus is uh, from, the, from uh, the New York City government is being, fo is being placed on improving access to extremely affordable housing through group equity cooperative housing uh, especially with respect to changing zoning regulations and such that uh, stand in the way of uh, single room occupancy style uh, group equity housing co-ops. Uh, yeah. HPD, um, I de we'll definitely follow up on that, but um, housing isn't um, within my office for sure, um, but that sounds really interesting. I haven't even read about that, but uh, I'm really intrigued about, about that. Take the MWBE question, and then say I feel like you have the, the public banking. Um, I want to name so you know when we talk about policies that accelerate this work, I want to. I'm going to go in the weeds here, but it's just really important to me. Procurement policy is a really crazy beast. Um, it's a symptom of federal government, then delegated to states, and then cities fall into that. Um, and particularly around you know. Um, so when we had the decentralization of city services that resulted in contracts, uh, the question then became, well, contracts for whom? Um, there's a significant amount of litigation around this. Um, and actually, we very narrowly targeted and came up with an, a minority and women-owned business program. And actually, across the country, these have been under attack and threat. Um, in fact, in New York State right now, we have to reauthorize it. So I will say, for anyone taking New York State advocacy, please have it on your mind that um, Albany has to defend the fact that we say that though in New York City and New York State, women and people of color are significant investors in our tax base, they are not part of the business that operates that. Um, so. Procurement policy is a, is a peculiar beast, um, and we have what's called a disparity study um, that names really um, tailored rationale for why um, we have to justify that we are um, 
enabling pathways for to make sure that there's a level playing field for minority and women-owned businesses. I say that to say because especially as we talk about employee ownership, um, for us to continue to move procurement policy towards something that has shared ownership, that's the paradigm. This disparity study paradigm is this weird beast that we are in. I'm not going to bore you all with more. Look it up. Uh, it, it's critical because it's um, one of the other things that came up. I was discussing this with Roger Green. Ironically, though, we can't have social purpose for our procurement. Um, we just have to go with the lowest bidder. Um, we do have a procured uh, purchasing in the federal government and in this state um, for enterprises where there's products made out of prisons by people with disabilities and people who are blind. So worth looking into. Um, specifically about what we're trying to do to make it easier. So that's the context we're in, which is why it's so difficult for businesses to certify. We are constantly trying to do better, and now we are really trying to open up and make sure that those are not holding back businesses that are eligible because they're owned and controlled by people of color, but together, right? So that's one of the really important frames we're trying to just get some clarity around, but, but because the context is so... Um, narrowly tailored, we want to, it has to be very explicit so that we can have the legal standing to promote this program. Um, and then to be very clear, uh, you know, one of the challenges with MWBE programs in our city and nationally is that um, even to say women-owned businesses owned by white women historically that are eligible are also poised still to be more successful. Um, and so we are really laser targeting, as I said, because women of color owned businesses are job creators, why are we not honoring that aspiration and talent? Um, so we are trying really, uh, in really intentional ways to understand and, and try to create programming that addresses that. Um, but procurement policy is a beast, and I'd love to talk to anyone who wants to take uh, advocacy action and learn more about how we can make that conducive to the goals we have. Um, and I, can, I can give an update, oh, to the person leave. Um, oh, there you are. Uh, I can give an update on the public bank local campaign. So Public Bank NYC is a coalition that um, officially launched last summer, um, but has been working, uh, many of the groups in that coalition have been working and researching public banking for a few years before that. Um, so we have, what we've been doing, so New Economy Project is staffing um, the coalition. It includes more than two dozen um, or so organizations around the city right now. Uh, it includes groups that are community-based and constituent-led. It includes uh, community development financial institutions that represent potential partners for a public bank um, in terms of doing local lending directly to New Yorkers and for local projects like co-ops. Um, it includes uh, some worker and labor groups uh, and, and a few others, um, CLTs, housing organizations. So it's, we're building out a broad base of support for uh, this kind of a very ambitious multi-year campaign. Um, sorry, there's a hand in the back. Were you raising your hand? Oh, okay, sorry. I wasn't sure if you were wanting to interrupt. Um, so, um, so, you know, the idea behind a public bank, a public bank can be a municipal city, a city with a Y bank, it can be a state level bank, it can be regional. What we're fighting for in New York is a municipal bank. Um, that would be able to take public dollars, it's the, it would be the bank for the city of New York, um, and be able to reinvest it back into local neighborhoods and our local economy. Uh, in the vision that groups are sort of developing for the chartering of such a bank, there would be a prioritization for supporting initiatives that had an equity kind of focus to it, so initiatives that created jobs in communities of color that created deeply and permanently affordable housing, sort of all the things that mainstream finance does not necessarily want to support, but that provides real economic opportunity for New Yorkers. Um, there's a very specific racial and gender justice lens uh, for the campaign. And uh, we've been working really hard on sort of building, again, the organizing component for the campaign, doing massive public education so that New Yorkers members of different organizations understand what we're even talking about. Like, you, it doesn't get much more technical than this. But really working closely with groups to draw, really like tease out how would something like a big bank for the city of New York support needs in your community? What are the kind of entities it could partner with to create better economic outcomes in your neighborhood? 
how would it connect, connect up with existing struggles and efforts by, you know, for worker rights or for, um, you know, greater local ownership of, of businesses and, and so on. And so it's been a really important process. We want to make sure that there is uh, sort of an institution that's actually informed and shaped by people and communities that we want the bank to benefit. Right, we don't want this to be this like wonky thing where there's like you get a, an elect, you know, one elected official or one researcher to design the bank and introduce it. And there have been a lot of attempts like that around the country, and they fall flat because guess what? The mainstream banks don't want to see a public bank, and they come out in massive opposition. And there's no base of support or even understanding among group, community groups and advocates about what this even is. There's no one to fight for it. So we feel like the coalition building piece is a very different, unique approach here in New York that we've adopted, and we think it's really important for accountability and all for success long term. Um, we have definitely all the wonks that want to be involved are involved in doing the deep research that's needed. So we know this is a multi-year, very ambitious effort. We're looking into legal and regulatory issues surrounding the creation of a bank or other entities, perhaps, along the way. Um, you know, we're looking at different governance structures and how would you actually have a bank that didn't, that is publicly owned through government but doesn't become co-opted by elected officials, right? It's clearly an important thing to figure out. Um, and we're working with uh, lawyers that have specific expertise in municipal finance. We're doing lots of freedom of information law in foiling um, to get data from the city about what its current banking relationships look like. And we just, we have a very broad, deep sort of uh, campaign plan that is going to keep people engaged and have milestone wins along the way to perhaps a, a, a different entity, a new kind of entity that would allow New York to do banking in the ways that reflect the values of the city of New York, right? And so um, in an earlier session, we were talking about this. And part of this is kind of a paradigm shift. It's a public education campaign. And it's about sort of this broader vision of the city being able to use public money in ways that really benefit the planet, our neighborhoods, New Yorkers, rather than being invested in Wall Street companies that right now are fueling so many destructive and devastating practices, both here in New York, in our communities, but also globally. Can we have another round? Yes. Three, yep. Yep. three, uh, three questions, one yep. right after another, and then we'll uh, have the panel answer that, and then they'll also sum up. Okay, we got a question over here. Hi there. Um, so uh, I thought it was interesting what you were saying about the MWBE, and that you actually had to, that you were having to do justification going to Albany, and I was wondering if um, what what that looked like, and if if there was ways in which you needed help with that. Um, I'm a minority woman business owner. Um, I found out I was operating for four years before I found out that it even existed. And so I'm also wondering um, what you, are you actually like looking for people uh, actively or are you waiting for them to come to you? I mean, is there, is there a way? Because I, I was, my mind was blown when I found out that there was, and then I also found out that, you know, as far as women in construction, which is what my, I have a, a a green construction company, um, that it seemed like there was a lot of people who were fronting as such. And, um, and then I'm the real deal, and I still haven't been able to um, get through the process just because I'm so, I have so much not seen. So wondering, um, one, how to get help and how you're finding people. Okay. Um, Vandra, do you want to, you want to, here, you want I certified um, a couple of three years ago, and now I have to get recertified. It's taking me forever to get recertified. I work with a local um, community development corp. She calls in. I've, there are a couple of other folks in the small business. Could you please <laughs> tell me what my recertification is? But the other more in interesting thing is um, I actually have a small uh, compost collection a service, so I'm, I'm now in waste management. Just a very, very interesting uh, world. Um, and it turns out that the Department of Sanitation has like the lowest rate of using minority and women-owned uh, businesses. So there's a big issue, you may know 
uh, Kevin Wells, who's just been pulled into sanitation, to actually encourage um, how to how to get uh, folks involved in. Um. So well, I'd love to hear you speak to that because I just heard you say that actually the issue of um, social causes. So I'm now part of the cohort of micro haulers. Terrific. We're but we actually have more of a social mission. And in fact, we want to make as part of the uh, rules and regulations of micro hauling that you have to have a social vision. That it should be limited to small businesses, to worker-owned co-ops, to B Corps, et cetera, that, that category of um, endeavor. So then when I hear you say, oh no, it's, you can't have social causes, just Okay, uh, do we have a third question? Or do I? I, I have a question. So, oh, we have one over here. Okay. Sorry, thank you, Ron. Um, I, I just want to revisit the, the, um, the, the point that was made about um, education and kind of uh, you know, really cultivating the, the, the ground to, to, to allow for robust workplace democracy to emerge. Um, I was really happy that you made that point explicitly. I think it's really, really critical. And, um, you know, because the, you know, just the, the myriad skills and, you know, kind of, um, you know, fundamental orientation that are required is really deep and needs to be, be nurtured over time. So if we're going to put that into practice in the municipal framework, what might that look like? You know, what are the options? You know, how can we create programs to, um, you know, really support training the next generation of, you know, um, a, a democratic labor force? Uh, I want to ask my question really quickly, uh, which is, um, and I guess this is for the city people. Um, there are current uh, economic development funds. I mean, they're at the state level and the city level, um, and a lot of inclusively owned enterprises feel like some of the rules that they have make it very difficult for them to access the existing economic development strategies that get channeled to larger institutions. Um, and I wondered, especially around, co you know, for cooperatives about what kind of work is happening within the city to re-educate um, some of the economic development agencies about, you know, the charge for having them rethink the way the city council kind of had a charge of to the small business services think about worker co-ops. Well, that's one agency that had that charge, and there are a lot of other economic development arms. Um, and I wondered if there was a, any similar charge going on um, to have them re rethink how they. Um, present themselves and make themselves available. Um, and if there are things that, structures that they have that could be limiting uh, for some of the institutions that we have in this room. Um, so let's go down, um, let's reflect on these wonderful questions and also let's, let's have closing thoughts. That's tough, that's great. Um, first, on the question from the MWBE community, um, I, we want to continue to connect and serve you, and so I'll just say, let's be in touch um, about how to how do we accelerate the certification. I, I want to just name the two things that you've said here, which is, you know, so I just want to be clear that what I've said about the preference in procurement is about MWBE rather than, um, or the naming it rather than a social purpose. You all can do business with the city. It's just that that cannot be the rationale for why there might be incentives. Um, just to make that clear. And part of the reason why we have to certify and recertify is so that we truly have businesses owned, controlled, managed by um, women and people of color. Um, it's a tricky and tight parameter we've given. I, we are trying really to think about how do we organize to broaden and push that forward um, so that we're really using that dynamically and not in, in a limited way. Um, and I'll just name and say, I think this is the first time, I think historically, the MWBE frame nationally and in the city has been about individual businesses being asked to overcome the barriers they may face um, as an entrepreneur of color, as a woman trying to move forward. And what we're really trying to build is a broader community, both among you and your employees, but also across one another. 
other. And so um, that's critical to us. We're trying to build that. Um, we invite you to speak to your state legislators. We cannot, you know, actually lobby ourselves, but definitely can connect you with how you can be an advocate. Um, I just want to say two things quickly. On the training, I want to really ask us and invite us. Um, I'm so proud to be a CUNY alum, and I'm so proud of how many people across CUNY are helping us to scale that vision. Um, and I think that's a really important, I'd love for all of us to really reflect on how this institution can continue to be at the leading edge and how the city can support that. Um, and then on this question of economic development funding, I think we're absolutely trying to ask how that can look different. What's so interesting, and I actually wonder if, Day, you have some experience on the housing side from this, is so many of our economic development incentives are as of right, and they're about real estate. And so, so much of what is actually at that top line is how much space do you need? That's what triggers it. And I think as a, as a co-op movement and folks really thinking about alternative enterprises, I'm excited to think about what we have to ask about space and about how we can connect that bridge. Um, I wonder about CLT models and other ways that industrial and commercial space can allow us to um, really come affirmatively into some of those economic development incentives. And conversely, um, how New York City, among other cities, grappling with how do we not make this a race to the bottom. Um, so I, I hope we're at the leading edge of trying to redefine what that looks like. Um, and I'll just say as a wrapping thought, I think, um, again, I'm humbled that we have this charge and the vision of Deputy Mayor Thompson, but want to really invite all of us to sit at the table of, like, we are our municipal leadership, and so we have this charge. I hold that humbly. We can be held accountable to it, um, but we want to be held, as, you know, as Day said, it's not just about city government doing differently. It's about working differently together. I'll just really quickly mash Abby's and the gentleman's question in the back on education. And um, of course, grab one of these uh, excerpts of our policy frameworks. Um, um, we like to disseminate that widely this, this summer. And one of our hopes, um, with the help of, of Christine, and her working group is uh, is that we develop a working group that starts to work with EDC and other agencies, HPD, um, and to start discussing this very topic and um, how we can change economic development for the better uh, through these structures. So we're hoping this this document, as it when it's fully fleshed out, we can uh, use it as a, a launching uh, for public education, agency education, um, all of it. So, thank you. Um, yeah, you know, what, one of the things I was hoping to get across is that within um, and, and among all of the different kinds of cooperative and sort of cooperative economics and, and related sectors, there's increasingly this collaboration that's happening on the ground, um, you know, among the CLTs, among the worker co-ops, among groups that are, again, creating community-owned energy initiatives and, and on and on, right? And so there's this now kind of growing shared vision um, for what a, a kind of healthy community looks like and how, you know, people can have better control, greater control over their daily lives and their sort of own economies. Um, I don't think it's happened yet at the interagency, at the agency level, right, in government. And I think that that's something that, um, you know, is a real priority and should be something that we can all kind of figure out together. Um, you know, I know with the CLT, I'll give you one example of the challenge of working with policymakers, right? So um, HPD, uh, our housing agency, has embraced and channeled um, support to community land trusts in the city. There are more than a dozen CLTs right now taking root in different neighborhoods in every five, all in all five boroughs, and have very different models of kinds of housing and other development they're doing. Um, due to s sort of the way um, certain tax exemptions work for housing development, um, you know, HPD is sort of requiring these CLTs to incorporate under a specific part of state law. And, um, and part of that means that to get the sort of to qualify here, um, you can, you have to be a real housing focused entity and the non-housing development you do has to be ancillary and it's kind of debatable how much that can be, but it raises a bit, like kind of a little, you know, it, it threw the CLTs for a loop because it's not a housing land trust, it's a community land trust. And a healthy community needs more than housing, right? It needs jobs and open space and playgrounds for kids and food access. 
Um, and so because through that, we're you know figuring all these like legal workarounds to it. But it seems like there should be a better way, like a more streamlined way, um, to have than having to create multiple entities and you know kind of weave it all together. So whatever, we'll f everyone will figure it out for themselves. But um, I do think if there was a way to sort of get agencies across the the board to sort of figure out how to best support these models would be powerful. I know that we and many others around the city have kind of talked about different ideas um, for shared policy advocacy. And one idea that's being discussed and explored is like, should New York City, like some other cities, have an office of cooperative economics or whatever it's called that would be mandated, sort of would set goals and targets for the city, would have a mandate to increase th this part of our economy by a certain percentage, um, could implement sort of across different agencies implement that, like do an audit, right, of the agencies, like how accessible is EDC and, H and all of them to these kinds of enterprises, and really enforce this mandate across different parts of city government. Um, you know, again, it's like sometimes there's trade-offs to, to creating entities and people in government change and you don't know. So I feel like that, that's just something that's being explored and figuring out, does that make sense for a place like New York? And how do you create that kind of structure that still is uh, really informed by the work that's happening on the ground and accountable to it and taking the lead from those organizations rather than sort of turning into something that b might backfire in some way down the line? Um, I think I'll just comment briefly on a sort of public education campaign. I think we just need to start talking about all these issues, solidarity economy, co-ops, inclusive ownership, collective ownership, everywhere we go, we could have house parties, um, you know, and talk about it. We can have open forums, right? If we get our young people actually creating co-ops and things, then usually the families come with them or come to support them, and so that's a way to get it out more. Um, and then finally, we do need an ad campaign, right? I don't know where we're gonna get the money or what, but we need some great ads. We need, we can, you know, we can do it. We've got Laura Flanders with her hand up already. Um, but yeah, we need to put our money into a, a big ad campaign and um, just bl blast it. Thank you, everybody. Yep. Yeah.